Are you ready? All right. So before the break, we talked about this, like uh, the common source stage with and without the generation and with different kinds of load extensively. So one of the things that we are going to do now, we are going to quickly talk about the other two stages that should make it relatively simple to cover based in the context of what we've done so far. Now, and then we'll use those to develop further stages and go to more complex stages. So these stages that we're talking about are essentially, if you think about them, are the Lego building blocks of bigger designs. Now, it's very important to know what your building blocks look like and behave and how it, when you want to think about how they interact with each other. So these units that we, are, we have introduced and we will continue to introduce today are the ingredients, the basic ingredients of design. So we'll talk about that and we'll see how it works. But there are two more blocks for the MOSFET that we need to think about. The next block to think about is the counterpart of what we call the emitter follower or common common uh, collector. So this would be basically common source or, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, common drain, not common source, common drain or source follower. So this stage is a stage where the input is applied to the gate and the output now is taken from the, the source. So this is V out and this is V in. Now from, a, and, and then this device has a W over L and this is some sort of an RS. Now, for a device like this, you can always think about writing the expressions, and you know what the ID is. ID is basically related to V in minus V out, because that's VGS. So VGS of this transistor is V in minus V out. So ID of this transistor is mu n C ox over 2, W over L, V in minus V out minus VT squared. And we also know that this current times this resistor in the absence of an extra load is going to be V out. So V out is basically RS ID, which you can write as RS mu n C ox over 2 W over L V in minus V out minus VT squared. So now you see that you have a quadratic equation for V out in terms of V in. If you're really keen on solving this equation, you can go solve it. You get a quadratic solution of a quadratic equation that will have square roots in it and all those things, and you will get something. Okay? But the key part is that, that if this current is not changing a lot, the VGS minus VT, or, or VGS in general, is not going to change that much. You can keep it relatively constant. And if that's the case, this node will follow that. Now, the other interesting thing in the MOSFET, which is not as much of a parameter of design in bipolar because the exponential is so much stronger than the quadratic, is that you can actually, by changing these parameters of the W and L, you can control what this voltage drop is. So you can not only provide a follower where this output kind of like try to reproduce the input more or less faithfully, the other thing is that you can actually make this DC drop controllable. So you can actually use it as a level shifter, what we call. So you can actually send, use this to adjust the level of the DC level. So for example, if this is too high, you can lower it to this level. Or if you use a PFET one, you can get start from a lower DC level and get to a higher DC level by controlling the W over L. So if you want one at a larger drop, for example, for a given current, what would I need to do to the W over L? Do I use, so let's say I want to increase this drop this level shift, right? Do I need a larger W over L or smaller W over L? A smaller one, right? Because a smaller one would require a larger gate overdrive to produce the same current. It's easier to think about if you think about it as being biased as a, instead of a resistor with a current source. If you had a current source here that was going through here, then you will see the same thing. But anyway, so now from a small signal perspective, what does this look like? Again, your source is not grounded. So T model would produce more natural results. So this is what you're looking at. In the absence of the body effect, so this is IS1, IS1, RM, and RS. So in the absence of body effect, this is a trivial calculation, right? What is the gain of the stage? Rs divided by Rm plus Rs. It's a resistive voltage divider between these two voltages. So that's what it is. Now, in the presence of that, in the presence of body effect, what you had, you have the second transistor here that you have to take into account. So it's Rmb 
it's IS2, and this is going there. This is grounded. So this, this current source plays no role, really. Neither does this one, if you think about them, right? Because, th first of all, this resistor is in parallel with the RS. So I can bring it down here and put it as RMB here if I'm really interested in IS2, which I'm not. I would write it down here. And then this current source is shorted on both sides. So the current circulates inside through the ground. Doesn't matter. Doesn't really play a role. So this is my equivalent circuit. And even this guy is not doing anything, really, because the voltage source on this side. So it's a voltage source parallel with a current source. Now, what's a voltage source in parallel, an ideal voltage source in parallel with an ideal current source? It's just a voltage source. What's a, an ideal voltage source in series with an ideal current source? It's just a current source, right? So this one is right, really doing anything. So this is the equivalent circuit I need to look at, and I don't really need to worry about this anyway. So it's, again, a resistive network, very simple resistive network. Right? If you want to get rid of RMB right here and there, uh, now this is chi RM. I'm sorry, RM over chi. So it's going to be RM over chi. And so you can do the calculations this way. This is the parallel combination of RS and RM, uh, RMB. So you get RS parallel RMB divided by RS parallel RMB plus RM. And it's just some simplifications here on basic algebra. So let's quickly do that. So it becomes RS RM over RS plus RM divided by RS RM plus RS RMB plus um, so well, yeah, it's fine. And RM RMB divided by RS plus RM. These guys cancel. You can divide both of them by RM. You get RS over RM, this is RMB, sorry. RMB, so you get RM plus RS times 1 plus chi. So what does it tell you? Again, it's a voltage divider ratio between the RS and RM, but it's a little bit different because it's really, in here, you have the RS scaled by 1 plus chi because of the body effect. And if, you, if body effect is not there, chi is going to be 0. So it's, you're going to get back to that original calculation that we didn't write, but we talked about. So the gain is always less than 1. But well, the input impedance is high. The input impedance of the previous stage was high, too. So in terms of impedance adjustment, this stage is not particularly very useful because in MOS transistors, the input impedance is high anyway. So it's not as commonly used for impedance transformation for the input side. And you will see this will have an impact on the topologies of op amps when you do them in MOSFET and bipolars. When you make a bi bipolar op amp and a MOSFET op amp, you will see that in bipolar op amps, there's several stages, several of these stages used between the gain stages because you want to make sure that you present a large enough input resistance to the nodes that have a high impedance, your gain nodes. But in MOSFET, the input, the DC part of this thing is infinity anyway, so you can actually directly go to the next stage. But in bipolars, you don't. So you may not see those intermediate stages as much in a MOSFET op amp as opposed to a bipolar op amp. But from an outside perspective, it still presents an advantage. Because if you think about this, the output resistance is smaller. Because the output resistance, when you null the input, is the parallel combination of these three resistors, right? What is that? What the output resistance is, RS parallel RM parallel RMB. So it's smaller than RM, right? And this parallel combination, you can also write it as basically RS parallel RM over 1 plus chi. So it shows that you, your output resistance is actually quite low. It can be smaller than RM, which means that it's a good driving stage. If you have a load that you need to drive and it, it's not a very large resistance, you need to have something with a relatively low source resistance, which is basically means that you need a small output resistance. So as a driver, it can be quite useful. 
and we will see how to use the get later. Um, so that's for what we call the common gate stage. Uh, sorry, common source, uh, com common drain. Uh, I said everything. Uh, common drain or source follower. Now, the last stage we will be talking about is what we call the common gate, which is the count whose bipolar counterpart is common base stage. So this stage is really a stage where you have a transistor here, you have a voltage source here, and then you have an RD. And then this is V out, and this is V in, and this is VDD. You can write a V in V out characteristic as well, right? It's, it's, I'm sorry, this is not V in, this is V bias. This is a fixed voltage, and this is V in. So the input is applied to the source, and the output is taken out of the drain. Now, you can do a large signal characteristic for this, which is simple. You can say, well, the drain current of this thing, ID, is mu n C ox over 2, W over L, um, VGS, which is V bias minus V in minus VT squared. And that current is what's drawn out of the resistor to produce V out. So V out is going to be VDD minus RD ID. And you can plug this into here, and you will get a relationship between V out and V in. And if you look at that equation carefully, you, what you will see that it's a non-inverting stage, meaning that as you increase your V in, your V out is going to go up like that. Now, from a small signal perspective, um, I am going to ask you this question. So think about the, fourth trans the second transistor, the fourth terminal. It's connected this way. What do you think is going to happen? intuitively. Now you have two transistors in parallel that are actually all three terminals of these two transistors are in parallel from an AC perspective, right? Because from an AC perspective, this terminal is what? Is ground. Because it's now fixed bias. The gate is ground. So is the bulk. So now you have two transistors whose all three terminals are in parallel. Now, if you have all three terminals of a transistor, three ter two transistors in parallel, what do you expect their behavior to do, kind of like in aggregate? They're going to help each other, presumably, right? They're going to do the same thing. So let's see what body effect does in this case. And you can see it from the small signal model. Again, if you look at this, so you have an RD, you have an IS1, you have an IS1 RM, and then you have the back gate transistor, IS2, RM2, ground, and this is ground, and this is your V in, and this is your V out. If you look at this very carefully, or just a little bit carefully, not even very carefully, you can easily see that RM and RMB are in parallel. Right? So I can redraw this like this. I can say V in RM parallel RMB. And this being, I call this IS total. And then I have a current source, or I could make it change the direction, really. Let's call this IS prime. And this is going to be IS prime going straight into the RD which is basically the sum of those two currents flip direction. Do you agree that this is the same circuit? Because you can see that these two are in parallel, one end grounded and one end shear, and these two are in parallel. So what is the total gain of this thing? V in converts to this through RM and RMB, and then multiplies by this. So you can easily see that AV is negative GM, oh, no, I'm sorry, not negative, GM, um, Rd times 1 plus chi. And if it's not obvious, just you need to expand this and divide this to calculate Is1 and plug it in here. So 1 plus chi appears there too, the ratio, the, the, the correction factor due to the back gate transistor. But this time, it's appearing somewhere good. It's multiplying, which basically means that this new transistor is really, I mean, the second transistor is doing some of the work is pulling its weight, right? Because they're in parallel. You've put them in parallel. 
And as a result, what you see is that they all, two, uh, all, the two of them work together to produce the gain that you need. So these three stages, so this is where I forgot to write it here. So this is common gate stage, um, are the key ingredients of the design. But now, there are all sorts of other things. So let's go back to our common source and talk about the gain. So we said the last thing that we said before the break was that if you wanted to get gain, let's say from our common gate stage, we had something like this. So you had the VDD, you had the ground, and then you had a V in and we had a V out. And then let's say we kept this as some V bias, V VB1. This is W, let's say, 2 over L2, W1 over L1. We calculated the gain of this stage, right? What was the gain of this stage? We said if there's a fluctuation V in here, this fluctuation translates to a transconduct through the transconductance GM1, V in, and then it's going to be pulled out of this node, which will have its own resistances. What are the small signal resistances you see? Looking up here, what do you see? Let's call this ROP or R RO2, let's say, or ROP, and then let's call this RO1. So the gain, as we calculated before, of this thing is going to be negative GM1 RO1 parallel RO2. We can even try to do some numbers and to get a feel for what we are talking about. So let's just pick some values that are not, I mean, crazy and again, more or less some mean, meaningful numbers. So let's say mu and C ox is 50 microamps per volt squared. And let's say mu P C ox are, is 25 microamps per volt squared. This may be more characteristic of uh, not super th short channel devices, but yeah, I mean, that's a starting point. Um, let's say you have a DXD DVDS of N of 0.1 micron per volt. And let's say you have a DXD DVDS for P of 0.05 microns per volt. Um, yeah, let's just keep those. Again, these are not particularly short channel devices, but just to get a sense. So let's calculate some of the key parameters, right? What is, let's say our current is, again, this is pretty relatively high, but let's say one milliamp. And then let's also say our W over L for these things, we pick them some, some, so let's say pick the W over L to be, I don't know, let's say 100 to one micron. Let's say 100 micron to one. Again, this is a long channel device. But for those numbers, let's see what we get. So GM N is going to be square root of 2 uh, mu N C ox W1 over L1, or let's call it GM1, W1 over L1, uh, ID. So we get 100 microamps per volt squared times um, W over L of 100, we said, times how many, um, you said one milliamp? Okay, so it becomes uh, 1,000 microamps. What do I get here? We get 0, 0, 0, 4, and 3, so it's like 10 to the 7 microamps. Ah, I should have picked something. Let's make this 100, uh, 100 microamps to make things. Actually, actually, that's probably even better. Microamps make our lives a little bit easier. It's a design problem. We can design it the way we want. So, yeah, so that basically gives me one milliamps per volt. So that gives me one millisiemens. Right? And for GM2, let's say we use the, so it, this one is half square root of 2 mu P C ox W2 over L2. Uh, ID, same current. So this is going to be one half of what it was. I can make my W over L, 
let's say the W over L is the same. So I get square root of two of that, so I get 0.7 millisiemens. So let's say both of them have a W over L of 100. OK? So I get 0.7 because mu, mu PC ox, I said, is like half of that mu and PC ox. Now, also, we have to calculate the RON and ROP. Let's calculate those. So RON is um, what? It's L divided by ID times DXD DVDS inverse. So L is 1 micron. Um, ID is 100 microamps times um, or divided by, let's say, 1 over 0.1 microns per volts for the N, right? So the micron cancels micron. You end up with, so, ten, so you end up with um, 1 volt divided by 10 microamps. What is that in ohms? That's 100 kilo ohms, right? Because 1 volt by 1 microamp would be 1 mega ohm. So this is like 100 kilo ohms. And for ROP, well, this ratio is half, so this becomes like 0.05. And the dimensions and the currents are the same, so you get 200 kilo ohms based on this. All right? So, so those are the parameters. Those are the numbers I have. 100 kilo ohms, 200 kilo ohms, 1 millisiemens, and 0.7 millisiemens, right? If I need it. So here, let's look at this. So what is the gain at this, for this stage that we calculate from this? So we have 1 millisiemens times 100 kilo ohm parallel, 200 kilo ohm. What is that? It's uh, 67 kilo ohms, right? It's 2 thirds. Um, so it's like it's 67 kilo ohms. What is the gain of this stage? What is the gain? 67. 67. Negative, yeah, negative 67. 67 is good. So 67. So we got some gain. It's not spectacular, but we are getting some gain. So what do we need to do? If we want to increase our gain for the same amount of current, let's say, what are we? What are our choices? So always when we are trying to solve a problem, we have to first identify the biggest source of the challenge, the biggest source of the problem. What's limiting? So let's see, what is the most limiting parameter of these three? What is the one that has the most impact on us? Uh, well, yes, well, GM has an impact, but GM would cost generally speaking, right? It can cost either in current, which means more power consumption, or it can cost in W over L. So how does it cost in W over L? Well, we haven't talked about speed yet. But we know that the capacitances are W times L. So if you start increasing the size of the device, then you get more capacitance. So it's, there's a price. So let's say we want to live with the GM that we have for these reasons. And let's say we want to see what else is left, R01 and R02, right? If I could change one of them, which one would you change first? R01, because that's the smaller one. That's the more limiting one. How would I do that? Well, we know that the output resistance of these kind of stages is going to, if you had degeneration, would improve. Now, would putting a resistor here help me? Would it help if I just put a resistor here and increase RON? R1? Yes, no, no. Some of you are shaking your heads. That's good. So why not? Why doesn't it help? Because it increases your RON, right? But what, does it, what else does it do? It reduces your effective GM, right? The gain of the stage. Because it was the ratio of this resistance to that resistance. So if you make this larger, it's not going to help by itself. So we have to do it in a different way. But we can actually do it by cascode. If we introduce a second transistor here, what that does, so this is V bias 2, we can actually have the GM of this transistor. And then since in MOSFET, there's no alpha even, so this drive is going to be the same, GMVN. 
But now the output resistance of the second transistor is what? It's going to go scale up, right? By how much? Well, we've done this calculation before, right? It was the output resistance right before the break we did this, right? This was the output resistance of a common, uh, a common uh, source uh, with its source to generation. But the degeneration is now R01. So RS of this transistor is simply R01 of this transistor. Let's call this. So the output resistance of this thing will be R03. So let's say this guy is transistor 3 in general W3 over L3, times what? 1 plus GM RS, which is now RO1. So this is GM3, RO1, 1 plus chi. Now, you can write all of these terms, or you can say roughly this is RO3 times, well, it's GM3, RO3, RO1. I'm essentially keeping this term. If you want to keep the 1 plus chi, you can keep it, but it's OK. So it's roughly GM3, RO3, RO1. So if you're designing it, I'm really focused on this term. And the good news is that there are a little bit of extra few terms that are increasing my output resistance. So I'm keeping some margin for myself. It's not a lot. So if my design works with this number, it's going to work with this number too. Because that gives me a larger output resistance, slightly larger, not a lot. And why slightly larger? Because this factor we know is on the order of 100. So this is 100. This is 1.1. So it's 100 plus 1 times R03. So it's basically, I'm saying that it's 100 times R03, whatever, R03. So my output resistance is going up by the intr intrinsic gain of this stage times the output resistance of what's it in source. OK, so now what is this number? So let, let's just calculate this number, right? So what, what did I have before? So it's GM3, which let's say it's the same as GM1. It's 1 millisiemens times 100 kilo ohms. That's 100, right? Times 100 kilo ohms. So it's 100 times 100 kilo ohms. That's 10 mega ohms. So now what is the new gain? The new gain is GM. So now gain becomes. GM, RO, so we have RO3, RO1, GM1, parallel RO2, which is the PFET. Now, this we said is 10 mega ohm. What was this thing before? It was 200 kilo ohms. So you have 10 mega ohms in parallel with two, oh no, not 10 ohms, 10 mega ohms. Uh, parallel with 200 kilo ohms, it's 200 kilo ohms. I mean, if you come and say, no, it's 197, 998, so well, you remember how many approximations we've been making, right? Don't bother. I mean, it's a waste of time. I mean, it, honestly, if you start doing that too much, it shows that you don't know what you're doing. And people do this all the time, but they don't know what they're doing. I mean, it's just numbers, this is what matters right now, okay? So it's going to be 1 millisiemens times 200 kilo ohms. What is the gain? 200. So we went from 67 to 200. OK. That was not much of an improvement. So we went to 200. OK, we got, well, you could say, oh, we got a factor of 3. But we can do a lot more. Now what if, how, what's the next thing to do? You have to take care of this. And now it's kind of like a clear path what we need to do, right? It should be obvious to everyone. OK, let's go to the top one, right? So we just basically introduce another one here, VB3 or whatever. Let's, let's make this consistent, VB2, VB4, VB3. Um, and then you have a W4 over L4. Let's say you keep it the same as that one to make life easier on us. So what is this input resistance? What is the, well, the output resistance here? It's this, whatever that was. What, what was that? We said two kilo, 200 kilo ohms. So this was 200 kilo ohms times GMRO of this transistor. It's GM is 0.7, it's RO is 200 kilo ohms. So it's, 0.6, it's, one, 100, it's 140, right? 
is 140, so you get 140 times that, which becomes, what, 28 mega ohms, right? Which is basically roughly, well, that, that is GM4, RO4, RO2. So now you replace this one with that parameter. So now you're going, we are going to GM, RO3, RO1, GM, this should be GM3 actually, GM3 parallel with um, RO4, GM4, RO2. Let me write this in the same format too. So now you're talking about what? You're talking about this was 10 mega ohms. This is 28 mega ohms. The parallel combination of these things, I don't know, it's like seven, eight mega ohms probably. I don't know, we can calculate this. 28 divided by 38. Um, yeah, so let's say seven mega ohms roughly. Right. Seven mega ohms times one millisiemens. What is the gain? So now. What are, what's our gain? One millisiemens times seven mega ohms? 7,000, right? 7,000. So now we are talking. Right? So what's the next step if I want to get more gain? What should we do? Well, in MOSFETs, unlike bipolars, there's no limit. If I introduce a third one in... Sorry? So this is no, no, this is GM1, yeah. Because that's your drive. That's what converts your voltage to the current. Uh, yeah, this is becomes GM4. No, this should be, sorry. This is incorrect. This is GM3. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. That was, a, that was an error. Um, yeah, so that's, but now what's the next level? Next level is basically make it a triple cast code, right? Now, I mean, just for the sake of argument, let's do it and we'll discuss it briefly. So let's say that very quickly we do that, right? I'm not gonna bother too much. What are we gonna expect to see? You're gonna expect these things to get multiplied by their respect, another GMRO, another factor of 100. So then it means that your resistance as you're talking about are on the order of a giga ohm. Okay? So if you could make a giga ohm resistor, you would get another factor of 100 increase or another in, in the gain, let's say another factor of 100 is not 70, factor of 60. Or, but, but is that realistic? Now you need to really think about the physics. You can't let your mathematical, the mathematical abstraction that you created fool you. It's kind of almost like idol worshiping, right? You make it and then you worship it. You have to realize you made this. <laughs> Whatever kind of idol you want to make, right? Math can be that idol too. So it's just basically, you make some abstractions, yes, giga ohms. And then you get like hundred thousands of some gain. Okay. What is, what is going to break down? Is that valid? Yes. Say again? Uh, speak up, sorry. Body effect. Body effect could come in. Yeah, body effect. But body effect is having some limited effect, right? It's a 10% effect. There's something even, so that's, that's a good observation. We didn't take body effect into account. But there's something even more basic that's going to happen. And make a giga ohm of resistance. When you drop a voltage of one volt across a giga ohm resist, a resistor that's one giga ohm, what is the current that's flowing through it? A nanoamp. So if there's a Anything, anywhere that's drawing a nanoamp of leakage current would mean that the resistance on this node really is not a giga ohm. And you can't get it to giga ohms because there's this reverse current through this. You see, you have a PN junction, right, between the drain and the bulk. That has some reverse current. Even if you didn't have that, there's surface state, there's current that can pass through the imperfection of the surface. If you have a discrete device, you touch it, there's, there's, there's some sort of a grease or some sort of an impurity on the surface, the current will, some leakage current will pass through it. Even the plastic is not a perfect conduct, uh, insulator. 
So you have to be careful about these numbers. It, you cannot get a giga ohm. You may even be able to theoretically get it from this, but you may not. But sometimes you may not. Even, you may need to get to triple casco to even get to mega ohms, and that happens with more modern transistors because that intrinsic gain is smaller. So it doesn't mean that triple casco is a useless thing. It just means that you have to be cognizant of the numbers and see if that's in some design you got to the giga ohm. Then it means that you double casco was good. If you got to mega ohm with triple casco, then it means that you are still good with triple casco. Now, one last thing before we go is that this question of stacking, it seems that we are like doing it without any limit. Is there any limit to doing this other than this limitations of resistor? Are there any practical limits of this just stacking stuff like that? Well, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, Supply voltage. Both of you said the same thing with, in different words. One said headroom, one said supply voltage. Basically, how much supply voltage? I mean, you have to, each one of them, you have to sustain a certain voltage on them, right? To keep them operating in the pinch off region. If you are, if you're stacking six transistors and then if you have like a one volt power supply, you will see that you will run out of range of operation. So there are limitations to that. And that's why certain other stages, for example, a folded casco, then we'll talk about folded casco a little bit more later, but is designed. So you can actually take this and say, if I had a current source here, I can take my casco and make one of the transistor out of an NMOS, but the second transistor, this one, I fold it back and bring it down here. So this, so this is V bias and this is V in, would be a folded casco, not to be confused with differential pair. Differential pair has similar transistors. These are two different kinds, although they may look like that. And the idea here is that the AC current that you produce here, so this is V in, is producing some GMV in, and then this GMV in is going through here and being pulled out of here. So this is GMV in, and this is whatever your load is. So here, the idea here is that if you do this, you can actually have part of the voltage drop across here and another part across this if you switch from an NMOS to a PMOS. You may say, hey, well, what about this current source? This current source is not ideal. It has some resistance, right? Sure, but let's look at the resistor values. What do you see looking into here? You see RO. What do you see looking into here? If you make it out of a transistor, you see another RO. Right? What do you see looking into here? You're looking into a source, roughly. What do we see? RM, exactly. So this guy wouldn't do anything when it's in parallel with that guy. Even if it's not, if it's not an ideal current source, which it never will be. But it's OK. But by doing this, you break down the voltage. And we'll talk about this breakdown of the voltage and all those things later as we go. But just wanted to give you a heads up that this is an artifact of the topologies that we choose. And another artifact is the analysis tells you that you will almost never see a triple cascode in bipolars. But you do see, you do see triple cascode in MOSFETs because of the way the output resistance scales, because of that beta that was in one equation and it wasn't in the other one. All right, any questions? Okay, well, see you next time.